Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for this special interview with Anderson for the Science of Rowing. We're going to talk about music and how it relates to exercise and rowing specifically, but then we're going to kind of branch into a little bit more and I think this is going to be really fun. Just to give you guys a little background, Anderson and I met, what, last week? Yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, last week. So it's re really cool. You know, a, a lot of people have so many negative things to say about social media because there, there are negative consequences being on social media a lot, right? But there's also so many positives in terms of like how you can connect with people. And I really appreciate that Anderson saw a post that we did on Science of Rowing and it inspired him to leave a comment. And I, I responded back and I was like, let's take a call. Let's, let's talk. Originally, I scheduled it for 30 minutes and it was just such a fun conversation that it ended up going like over an hour. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited that we made this connection. So I want to kick it over to Anderson to, to give himself an introduction and a little background on himself, and then we'll get into it. Uh, hi, my name is Anderson Burrell. I really appreciate meeting up with you. It's funny in the rowing world, it's such a small community, but you know, a lot of us have our like two degrees of separation or one degrees of separation away from knowing each other. But then as the community goes and as people branch out, when topics come up, it's like you had posted something on like what's best to do in the warm up or pre race warm up or something. And that inspired me to be like, hey, I, I, I got some mileage moments on that. So let's chat. Yeah, I, I used to be a rower. I went to Nobles way back like mid late 80s for a couple of years i rode there i learned to skull at craftsbury my brother's a rower i try i ended up trying to play professional baseball moved to california and then i had to hang it up because i'm not a durable athlete it was good but uh all the surgeries and rehab and it, it wasn't the lifestyle for me plus the, my sort of my spiritual inclinations and the things that I felt purposeful about wanted to go in a different direction other than just continuing to be a competitive athlete. So I got a friend of mine um, was like, Hey, I'm going to teach you how to surf. Another friend of mine was like, Hey, I'm going to take you to a yoga class. And my mother had always tried to pepper in yoga positions and yoga breath worker and meditation as well in my like high school years. But I really got into it when I moved out to California and did a whole lot of immersion with amazing mentors on meditation, breath work, food, fasting, cleanses, energy work, just a, a wonderful healing arts people that really helped me to um, deepen my a love that had been inspired initially or connected with initially through sports, that transcendent feeling of like, oh my gosh, I am having an a, a spiritual flow experience where my sort of intuition and a lot of things were heightened. I was doing a lot of yoga study and I was helping people that were sick or injured. And it turns out a friend of mine was, uh, is now the wife of Mike Piazza. Um, she, Mike Piazza is a, a former baseball player, is a really solid guy and he was, he's in the Hall of, the Hall of Fame now and we had some time together. The New York Times did an article on how we were integrating yoga disciplines into the lifestyle of a professional athlete. And it was during the time where the steroid scandal was at almost its height with the Barry Bonds stuff. So it was like the, all, the other side of the story was like the healing arts integration and, and into it too. From there, Belmont Hill School, where I had gone for three years the coach there had gotten in touch I heard the coach saw the article about me and Mike Piazza and I got in touch with him and he said hey I saw the article would you come and talk to the guys so it was my alma mater I went back it was it just clicked great group of guys great era of rowing at the Belmont Hill School like just just clicked and so I packed up things in Los Angeles and I was like, I talked to the baseball players that I was with and went, it helped with Belmont Hill for a few years. It branched out into all sports. Uh, and then it turns out Harry Parker at Harvard uh, wanted to talk. Uh, we had an interview. Um, you know, it's fun. Here, I'll tell you this one. Here's this story. And I'm really happy to share this. Here's my job interview with Harry Parker. Do you want to hear it? 
Yes, please. Okay. I'd come off of being around like with the Met. It was just short windows of time, but we got a lot of good stuff done. And then crushed it at Belmont Hill. And then I heard from Harry and I go into the lightweight lounge at Newell. I don't know. Have you been to Newell? It was Linda Murray, Bill Manning was on the floor stretching and uh, Charlie Butt. Harry walks in, sits down. They're on one side of the like the lounge. I'm on the complete other. So it's an awkward distance. I feel like it's an American Idol thing. And like Harry is like Simon <laughs> Powell or something. I don't know. So they're all kind of just staring at me. And Harry, Harry's not even looking. And he looks up and he looks kind of annoyed. And he puts his hand out. And he's like and kind of impatiently. He goes, go ahead. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to get thrown. I could like cower and be like, oh, I'm Anderson. I do yoga. I like walks on the beach and chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, just talk, just go totally talk about like resume stuff or whatever. But I was like, no, 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 this is, this is for real. I, I'm going to have, I'm going to really if this is an interview to see how I, I am in this sort of environment, I'm just going to talk to this person straight. So I didn't power. I didn't go inwardly or talk about details about myself. I was like, well, I'm more of a doer than a talker. And as far as I know, with this, this sport and a lot of others, it starts with the feet. So if you don't mind, kick off your shoe. I'll give you a foot massage. Room goes more quiet. <laughs> Linda, Charlie, and Bill, like you could hear their necks turn to Harry. <laughs> Harry does not, does not blink, does not blink. He's staring at me, doesn't say a word, doesn't break eye contact, kicks off his sperry, puts out his sockless foot, and he's like, it, it was, it was game on. It was like, okay, back to you. <laughs> so I get up and I start praying my butt off. I'm like, anything, you know, I'm like, here we go. So I get down and I start saying, okay, the tension in the feet, the buildup in the tension of the feet is terrible, is terrible, especially for a rower, because this is what's on the foot plate. You have to be dynamic and powerful and everything. You have to move around this connected point. So as a professional student athlete, as a, a, a person in society who's mostly dormant and sitting and just, you, if you have bricks at the ends of your ankles, if you have a ten, unprocessed tension buildup, your body's going to have to change how it moves. It's going to have to change how it presses and pushes, and it's going to hit you in vulnerable places so you're more likely to get hurt. So if I'm trying to present to you where I would start, is just encouraging the people to understand that, you know, eight to 10 hours a day of mostly sitting and then coming in and strapping in, you're not going to, you're not going to get the most out of your training. You're not going to see the most of your potential. So, yeah. and I was like, there's that. I don't know if you know, but I, I wrote a book on the ankle, the foot and ankle for rowing. Yeah. So I got like, I got really deep into that. Um, yeah. And one of the interesting things that, that connects to what you were saying is, they've they've actually proven that your big toe is connected to your forehead <laughs> Lovely. so we, we know it's all connected right but the big toe has fascia that connects to the tip of it it wraps up the heel goes up your calf up your back up your neck and then it actually ends up connecting on your forehead i love so, that yeah super super valuable so one of the things in the rowing world as you well know with like the timing like there's there's not a lot of time the practice has a it's a set amount of time so it's like in a warm-up or in a prep sesh uh, if i wanted to be as efficient and effective as possible what i learned as well as what you found too is that if you if you work the feet you're going to release the calves you're going to release stuff in the knees the upper leg all the way up so if people are just focusing on hamstrings mostly or getting their back rolled out and doing the normal style personal prep in house. It's like, if I'm, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna crank on the feet first and then have that, that massive um, like dovetailing of what it affects. So yeah, that was my interview with Harvard. Oh, Harry left, then he comes back, Bill Linda and Charlie leave. 
me and Harry standing alone in the room. He's like, he looks really kind of upset. He's like, so how you want to do this? And I said, hey, it's your boathouse. It's your show. You let me know. I'm available. And he and then he went quiet again. And I was like, I didn't want to leave it too long. So I was like, how about this? What time do you practice tomorrow? And he's like, guys get in house like, you know, what was it back then? It was 3.15 or 2.15 or something. And I just said like a half an hour. I'll show I said, how about I come in a half hour before the first session starts? And he just goes quiet again. He's like, okay. <laughs> so that was it. I gave Harry Parker. So in terms of me getting back to like my background, it went from my personal study to like helping people out. And then it crescendoed into like involvement with Mike Piazza, article in the New York Times, and then work with Belmont Hill. And in the rowing world, there was, I did this thing called the BRC with Wayne Berger out of Newell, which was like top end guys that didn't want a new national team stuff, but it had a beautiful, fun experience. The guys of the BRC with Harvard, it, it went, it started getting involved with Paul Cook at Brown um it, doing summer camps and more involvement in a lot of different places and then went over to henley with harvard and a lot it was in the lead up to the 2012 games you know i knew a lot of people that were getting ready for the games in london so it turns out like one of the guys who was a harvard guy he was like hey could you follow us we're going to lucerne next can you come down because i'd love to get back to what we we're doing i need to get back so I started being involved a bit with his team and it just opened up into a bunch of different national teams. Cause you know, in the hen in the tents at Henley, you're all in the open spaces. So you start, people were seeing what we were doing with Harvard and wanted me to come show their kids. So I stayed over, helped out at Oxford a couple of times, did a bunch of stuff with the high schools, but went to Lucerne, went to, even got asked, uh, the Mexican team asked me to come down. So I helped them train for the pre-Olympic qualifiers in Argentina and whatever, and then bled. And so a ton of different countries and a ton of different, all levels of this sport I've been involved with. So I know what the similarities, doesn't matter what level, I know what the, the common culture, the common mistakes as I see it, but or the traps that people fall into that are pretty common. So I guess my background is, I love the experience of that, you know, I connected with through in sports and then found yoga and healing arts. And then I'm back around in the sporting world, kind of scouted out what I had connected with in the healing arts world. And then I, I tailor it to the time constraints and the vocabulary of that particular sport to make it like an efficient application of that kind of you know, what's categorically thought of as a, as a more floaty, unstructured healing arts realm, like breath work or, you know, energy arts or whatever. But it, it's really wonderful in the community how many people, it's, it's on a lot of people's radars, like meditation is more on, more on people's radars. So it's not like I have to like, it's not, it, the, when I talk to people, I don't have to try to convince them of, I didn't invent any of this. I just went deep for myself. And it's, it's becoming a, a lot easier to convince people. Like there, there's definitely a period where it was much harder, right? Like probably the first time you met Harry was, <laughs> he, he probably wasn't totally open to it at first based on that, that story. Yeah, it, it was, well, the funny thing is like, one of the things he and I got along with is, result that I wouldn't even had the gall to sit and be in that room or agree to a meeting unless I knew what had been passed on to me these these this heritage of information that I had put through my own filters to find what are the gems like what can I put pressure on and, and what are what are the diamonds of this what holds water so you know I think he he and I got along with results and I think one of the things that's cool about having conversations with you so far is it's not like you're just coming in and having a, a, a yoga session and leaving. You're, you're like very much engulfing yourself in the team and understanding what their lifestyles are, what their habits are, and you're finding yeah. ways to change their life as opposed to just running an hour long 
or 30 minute yoga session. Yeah, because it, it was an amazing dynamic with Harvard and Harry and Newell. I was basically living in the, you know, I was in a heavyweight men's lounge and that's where I was at. And my goal in this, in the rowing community had been, okay, how many guys do we know that like get stress fractures, like break their ribs or herniated discs or come out of college, not just with their diploma, but with like a, this issue or that issue or that surgery or needing couple surgeries in life or time of like pain meds and antidepressants or whatever. I was really passionate about, hey, I want to dismantle a lifestyle because the sport, it's like the problems that are coming out, the back issues, these are serious things that people don't come in house thinking, uh, you know, they're not afraid. Uh, one of the things I used to tell the guys who would come in a new, I would say like, are you in a safe place? And they'd look at me and they'd be like, yeah. And I'm like, have you ever heard of someone breaking their ribs or herniating a disc or like stress fractures in their vertebrae because of this? And they're like, oh yeah. I'm like, okay. And I started pointing to guys on the wall. I'm like, this guy, two back surgeries, this guy, this, uh, you know? And it's like, I wanted to bring up the, some of the realities to help them to understand that lifestyle adjustments might be able to help them stay away from life-changing injuries. I was constantly trying to say like, oh, at first it was like, oh, how do I stretch my back out? My back is sore, but why is your back sore? And it's not just hamstrings as the culture conveniently puts it. It's like, okay, for me, it was like, it's before, it turned into like, you're sitting in class for hours and hours a day before you come down. So you train your body mostly to be a sitter. And then you're trying to make it row and you're wondering why your back hurts and thinking it's the rowing that's doing it. It's like, no, no, no. we have to go to the lifestyle, change the lifestyle, get a different result in house, and then we'll get faster and safer and have more fun. But yeah, I got to live. I got to put the kids to bed on trips. I get to live with the athletes. I get to rub their feet while they're falling asleep or squeeze out, wring out their legs or like make them a smoothie or a salad or sick guacamole, like on camp and this. So my experience, and this is international too. I've helped with teams that I didn't even speak the language, but we, but we talked the language of rowing. So we got it. <laughs> But it's like how in this culture, how in this in this culture of rowing, how do we make it so we can get injury free and keep on refining the process of incorporating uh, human pursuits at well-being that optimize athletic performance coincidentally, like yogic breath work. OK, you get sick results from that. But how do you deconstruct it for a rowing stroke? Like, how do you do ujjayi at steady state? You know, it's like, what, where, where do we start? What do we do? And I, don't, I don't know if you, you have an official title that you would tell people if you had a business card or, or anything like that, but much more than a yoga teacher, for sure. Really, really getting involved with, with people's lives, which is, which is fantastic. So we're going to, we're going to kind of take this conversation into um, the article that I reviewed on music. And I think it's going to transition really fun into um, some breathing and the conversations as well. Just use Anderson's experiences to, to draw out some of his knowledge and, and share with our community. So I think it'll be fun. Just to give you guys, if you haven't read it, just to give you guys a good idea of what the article is. So 12 active individuals performed an all out 2K on the ERG after three different warm up scenarios. When no music was played, when preferred music was played, or when non-preferred music was played. What the researchers found was that listening to preferred music resulted in higher power outputs, faster 2K times, higher heart rates, and higher motivation levels. Coaches and rowers can use this information to strategically incorporate music into their individual training, team training, and pre-race environments. This article in itself was really positive. And then I also looked at research reviews and a, a, a bunch of studies 
and studies, as far as I know, have been happening since 1911 on music and exercise. So it's, it's, it's a long time coming. Um, in general, a lot of positive results. And I would say on the surface, looking at all of these results, people would just be like, okay, well, I guess we have to include it in the training. Maybe we should start playing music through the speaker in the boat. Um, if, if listening to music can make me 17 to 25 seconds faster on a 2K, like who needs a coach, who needs a coxswain? Like, let's just blare the, the music. So Anderson, a question to you, should we be this excited about music or are we missing the boat here? In all honesty, the way human beings respond to different styles of music. Yeah, we got to celebrate that and explore that intentionally. The challenge in the culture, how it shakes down in the day-to-day -day over the long season, is that the culture kind of uh, waters things down or uh, makes it more comfortable or makes it less intentional. It turns like great information, once it gets into the culture as a cultural norm, you're not necessarily getting the optimal effect of what a study has proven or what a practice, what the results of a certain practice is. Because the challenge in the rowing world is like you get a bunch of different kinds of people and then usually you get a, a group of people that dominate the playlist, you know, and well, it's their you, playlist. Usually the, usually the fast seniors, right? They're always the first one to the, to the speakers. Yeah, sometimes yeah, sometimes it's the first ones in house different styles of music. There's not enough variety from my perspective. If or since it's proven that preferred music is giving an uh, optimal performance to your point earlier about well during races you don't have it's a lot of people will say well you don't have you don't have music during the race. Because that's the case why don't we also add in sometimes no music at all, sometimes non-preferred music? What's the downside to constantly having the preferred music? Does it always give a good result? Maybe so, but on race day, does it make you uh, more of an insecure athlete if you don't have all the stars aligned, if you don't have the right amount of caffeine that you felt? If the driver took a wrong turn, if you don't feel like your normal jams are working for you on that day, something's off. Is constantly giving preferred music making other parts of your spectrum atrophy so that you're more likely to be a fearful athlete? Because what I've seen is what happens, what happens when you turn the music off or have a song that isn't like during a practice people will absolutely freak out like da, 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 the music or like, get the music change or, the song <laughs> change the song wait a minute i mean it's funny at first but is that for them to need is it making them dependent and I've seen definite behavioral responses that make it seem like they're dependent on certain things to feel like they can give their best performance. And I don't like that. I want them to be able to be good at no matter if it's rainy or you know sunny or good music or bad music, or if they had their right breakfast, you know what I mean? At a certain point, if we're shaking it, if we're trying to see it in the culture on the day-to-day -day of a long season, how do we make the results optimal? And I don't think it's always having preferred music because that's close to what it already is anyways. And when it's always that, then the joyfulness or the, 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 the freshness of it and the true effect is dampened down by it being like a consistent thing. I, I love like, ethnic music sometimes symphony music sometimes and then getting into like breath work you know silence but then i don't feel like the culture has refined itself enough that it's really covering the basis of breath work in the in within the um practices in the warm-up during pieces on the warm down breath work is is growing in the sports world but how to integrate it, how it, how to sew it into a start sequence, how to sew it into like steady state or short order, like 
shorter and stronger or longer and lower like breath work hasn't made itself into the the structure enough yet to just focus on the music so sometimes we gotta we you gotta have the the your attention onto your breathing and then singing songs i think i I told you about that thing the other day with that i watched when we were kings about ali and george foreman in the rumble in the jungle and ali was like hey i he was doing affirmations like i i he, like ali affirmations ali isms and it was it's a beautiful thing to watch he's such a genius and a poet and but he's talking to himself like affirmations and mantras and stuff while he's skipping rope and if you had the rowing and uh, if you had the at a steady state a group of guys doing like a team song or team this you know the military when they're out on the jo- out on a out on a run has these chants that they do and it's genius for the in- application of breath work breath science and what happens to the body when you vocalize when it's great for the efficiency of oxygen exchange you get fitter faster and stronger sooner if you can or and try to vocalize while you train so yeah i feel like yeah the study is definitely valid of course but when it shakes down to the culture what's the downside of being dependent on preferred music Mix it up, keep them guessing, hit it from different angles. What you made me think of, well, you triggered many thoughts, but I'll go this this place with it. I also found in this research that there's actually scientifically proven, um, I forget what it's called. They have, they have a name for it, but it doesn't really matter. People like to move together. And when people move together and in sequence together, there's this, there's this efficiency, there's this yeah. sense of things are easier and things actually do get easier. Yeah. Um, and it reminded me of, you know, you're in the boathouse, you have a row of ergs and you're matching up with everyone next to you. And do yeah. you remember like the difference in the energy in the room when all of you flowed together, right? And read together versus when someone was off in that sequence and it was like, it was more of a struggle to get through that workout. But, yeah, see, that, 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 that's a human phenomenon that happens not just in the rowing world. You'll have this, you'll link and sync up with people and there's this vibe, this crescendo. It's like like choir music, this uplifting X factor that in, you know, something special is happening when we're doing something together. And it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it happens and it's like, oh my gosh, it's reminiscent of like a spiritual experience and this thing, the, the, the zone or being in the flow, the transcendent performance, that's, that's not an uncommon thing. But it being voluntary is a challenge. Like make, making it happen intentionally to that uplifting, it's, it's more of a fluid x factor ethereal thing than just like okay we're gonna find that transcendent spot but with so we use music or um like when you have people singing together and there's that uplifting x factor there's a guy named john duyard that did a a nose breathing program called invincible athletics in 1993 my father found that program and he sent it along to me and it totally resonated with me so in the rowing world what i found is that when you say when people are exhaling at the finish where people normally if you're if you're if you're trying to with breath work pick a spot that everyone's pretty much on the same page it's at the finish and there's an exhale so i start there and if i'm trying to make that kind of stars align thing more likely to happen that togetherness that magic of togetherness i'm going to ask them to be like okay we're gonna make a sound at the finish all together what are the ways that human beings can match up to do things in time. We can watch each other and like to get that. But in a boat, you can't see everybody and you have to use other senses. 
like so one of the things i've found to help that 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 crescendo that 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 choir music kind of uplifting thing that happens is you, if you use a sound cue if everyone's doing a sh at the finish then it's it's a simple thing like there, you don't have to have a lot of buy in i'm not asking them to say a certain affirmation word or this or that just say make a sh sound at the finish together and then they can hear so it's not just with their eyes anymore or with their like senses or seeing the it's not just visually if i can make an audible sound it, then i can hear when other people are off and then they'll if the assignment is to stay with the sh sound everyone in the coxswain's like no nope, that's not it you know it you find it and then you get it and you ask them to get it together and when they find it and get that groove then you're doing a habit an intentional habit that sets the table for that x factor of the magic of togetherness to happen so the magic of togetherness is a wonderful and amazing thing but how do we set the table for it in the physical world so it's more likely to happen than just this random thing that we're dependent on the right song or the right mood or like you know who knows how it happens but in the yoga world in the meditation world in the martial arts world in the energy arts world the 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 ways the practices the breathwork practices the 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 different practices in the other these other fish bowls perfectly line up to being like okay as a human being if you were to do this for yourself you're more likely to transcend and if you do this together you're more likely to have that common experience that that human beings have that common experience is not just hoping for it you're you're diligently and intentionally welcoming it you're setting the table for the feast to happen yeah i mean and this this research was saying like people can use music to match up and and see what we did there we we took that research we took the idea with it we took it on the water where there's no music we took the the music that rowing creates in itself just the auditory feedback that you get from yeah. the sport and yeah. from from each other and we turn that into music on the water, right? And right. and you found you you turn that into a way of syncing up and and taking advantage of that rhythm and togetherness, yeah. and it's beautiful. The experience that I've I've had on the water with implementing these um, vocalizations, say say there's one that we do where it's like you start the sh sound when you're squaring the blade, and you carry the sound all the way through the catch drive to the finish, so. It's the prolonged shh. So, so normally the hissing of the boat that will happen, the, the normal, beautiful, poetic, wonderful, romantic sounds of a boat going through the water and the sounds of the oarlocks that like, it, it's a beautiful sound. But also when you get the shh, like four guys, eight guys, four people, however many people that are rowing, you get them doing in unison prolonged sounds. Or sometimes I, I have them, there's one team that does a yeah. They, at the finish, they all go, yeah, three strokes in a row. And it's called by a coxswain. It's like three yeahs. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it combines like a positive, nice word and vocalizing and rallying together, plus the breath work science of what they're doing in their bodies to breathe better when they're vocalizing. It's a beautiful, the coxswain's, Sorry, I jump around so much because I just I have so many experiences on the water where it's like you feel like you're in this spiritual experience and you're like, yes, I'm so glad I'm here right now. <laughs> um, so on a co the coxswains will feel and see in 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 it, they'll see the splits drop and the athlete, the perceived effort is lower because they're doing something that they're more efficiently fueling the effort plus they're doing something of, with togetherness and the joy it gets outside of themselves so the coxswains will see it in the cox box that the splits or you know the um stroke coach or whatever it is the um they'll see it in the splits the splits will drop when they vocalize together 
<laughs> and then they start having fun being as one. So that's good. That's so that's so cool to see because, yeah. like you said, with Harry, if if what you're doing is showing results, right? He he's all for it. He's he's bought in, and that's that's why you got involved with so many other people. Yeah, because if I say it, but it doesn't show up in the splits or the results or anything like that, it's like my whole thing as an athlete is that I was wanting to improve. And I wanted to have all these different styles of feedback, the information, the numbers, like the plates that I'm able to stack onto the bar. Like I want to see, I want to see numbers change and that will validate or affirm or something that I, I am doing the right things to improve. And I was constantly wanting to get, you know, better numbers. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're not seeing progress, it's hard to stay bought in. Right. Right. You're, Anderson, you're going to love this research. I haven't shared this with him yet, by the way, guys. Um, you're going to love this research because it totally supports what you just talked about. So uh, I read this music research. I read the backgrounds. And then I was like, OK, well, what does it actually mean to rowers? Right. And then I looked deeper and there's a lot of, uh, I think there's four, four or five studies. They look at acoustic feedback of the sport of rowing and amplifying the sound of the boat speed and how it, how it increases drive speed, how it increases the speed of the boat. Um, so it's dropping those splits just by giving this live feedback. But what they did was they basically, you know, took this machine and it, it, it had sensors and it read how the boat was moving through the water. And based on how the boat moved through the water, it was like, boop, like it showed a beep, right? Mm -hmm. But what you just demonstrated was if we use our breath, we're essentially doing that with the speed of the boat. So like if, if you do it with the breath as you accelerate, yeah. now I'm amplifying the auditory feedback of my boat speed. And I'm, yeah. a, I'm, in speed, I'm increasing my, my boat speed because of it. Like that's, that's yeah. so beautiful. And it's proved, it's proved by research. I, I love it. That's the beautiful thing about these healing arts pursuits. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a fun thing for me to have been an athlete and then to have also been around amazing, amazing, wonderful people that can pass on a, a different style of like a heritage of information and practices another way. But yeah, we're, we're, we're just meeting up in a really good place where science and the practices are in harmony. And, it, and the, our passion is to help the culture be aware that these studies are going on here. Let's keep on refining the process. Being realistic about the, the, the day in, day out of a long season and the adjustments to COVID, non-COVID lifestyle or protocols or whatever, and whatever age group or, or time of life that you're being able to be around the athlete, it's like you and I can get together and joyfully like be in harmony about, yeah, this stuff is awesome. You're more likely to have a, a transcendent day. Um, some of the fastest teams I've been around, there's this fun, like the season is fun. Like there was a bag on one team a long time ago. It was like a dance party warm up. But the, the, it was just joy. And like when a lot of times when you have people that, you know, that don't feel like they're having the season they want, they feel like they have to work harder in this grind. But some of the fastest teams you and I've probably seen joy is along with it so if we yeah. can if we can keep on promoting the techniques i was helping out in england and there's this coach that should sound if you get all eight say your own eight all eight every other stroke say catch to finish every other stroke for two minutes doing a shush sound or even one minute and then to see human beings gather around making a sound and like you know, and then finding it and then getting that magic, you're, it's a beautiful thing to be able to help the stars align. And that, that um, audio, that audio cue is really important. Like you said about like the fastest crews, having, having this joy and having this rhythmic connection. And what, one of the common things that I've seen across my coaching experience is the fastest athletes are the ones that smile when things get hard. 
<laughs> they literally they welcome it. They know they 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 know they can handle it, and they they welcome it with with positivity. And yeah. they have consistently been the fastest rowers on all of my teams. Yeah. The most successful people I've been around in all these different kinds of sports or whatever is that they don't they don't stop being curious. They they don't stop trying to refine it for themselves. So they got their go-tos. They got their go-to stuff, the stuff that holds water for them that they learned in the past, but it doesn't shut them off to being still a student and still fascinated at learning and becoming something like every day is day one let's 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 explore this further let's explore that, even that's, we, yeah that's been something cool with with us starting science of rowing because we haven't been around long but we've we've had this like really positive feedback and it's it's all of these you know beginner advanced elite rowers that are that are uh, interested in our stuff and they are all interested in getting better they just want yeah. they want to continue to learn they want to continue to get better and i think this is kind of a brief but funny story my sister's a yoga teacher mm -hmm. so she's very spiritual um i'm more into the science side of things obviously mm -hmm. <laughs> and cool. i remember her talking to me about breath and i didn't i didn't really agree with it initially years ago i was like yeah. i was like how like that doesn't make any sense to me because the you know the research and the science right and yeah. then it was explained to me years later using science yeah and it clicked with me and i saw the value yeah so bringing like you said bringing these worlds together bringing the spiritual together with the, the research and the the evidence and showing people that this this is real it's not just this made up thing that we feel or or imagine right i think that's a, that's a, the the breath like the studies and the i think there's more money being spent on uh breath science um so it'll keep on showing that the uh, disciplines of the mystics were in the yogis and, and these practitioners. You know, you know what really, what really kicked it off in the community that I, that part of the rowing fishbowl that I was a part of, the Wim Hof documentary in 2010, um, The Iceman, where that Dutch yoga instructor, have you seen it? I haven't seen it, but you, you brought it up in our oh, yeah, yeah, conversation. Yeah. All right. So Vice, the, that the company that does the, the good documentaries, Vice, they did a documentary on him. And um, I had been doing breath work with athletes for a, a tons of time. And um, guys on the British team, it's, you know, people want to improve, but they don't want to risk their normal splits too much on the day to day because it's a day there's daily urgency in the cultures so there's not a lot of people don't want to have to slow down to get faster too much like with with the rowing world especially with daily urgency it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the application of new information if the information hasn't refined itself to be like bite-sized palatable understandable like with your communications with your sister she was talking breath work from the yoga perspective the spiritual stuff but it wasn't matching up with your priorities so it just reminds me of my experience as the athlete it's like i learned these these beautiful wonderful things and and um uh, but I had to, I had to refine it down and speak baseball. I had to speak, I had to, I, you know, in the incorporation of yoga in the rowing world, you have yoga instructors coming in and trying to bring the rowers do, to do yoga rather than the yoga instructor going to where the rowers are at and like breaking yoga down for what the rowers what their priorities are i'm not trying to bring you to me i'm trying to do my best to bring me to you and filter it down communicate it to match up with your priorities and like and and it'll match up the science and the the ancient stuff the science and the ancient stuff will match up like with the feet it'll match up but we just if we're trying to be efficient let's just roll out our feet first and you know, change our citizen body and our sport body and here we go understanding the sport and and speaking speaking their language and 
meeting them where that's at. That's, that's super powerful. That's most of the pressure I put on myself is how do I develop it's, it's constantly uh, like infinite ways to communicate one thing. Cause the, the technique, the practice holds water, the practice, but for that individual, for that team, how do I communicate it in such a way that makes it appealing or understandable or logical or, or inspiring for that environment, for that person? So that's been, that's been the passion and challenge for me is how do I articulate it in one thing in many ways? Yeah, and it's not always going to work with, with each individual, so you're going to have to switch it up, right? Mm-hmm. So I found a study when I was doing this research that found that when you listen to 30 minutes of music that made you feel joyful it actually increased your blood flow by 26%. Uh, When you listen to music that made you feel anxious, it actually decreased your blood flow by 6%. So these people weren't even being active. They were, they were sitting passively and they were just listening to music. And it was, it was just based on the music they're listening to. Where, where does that take you? There's a couple of places that I, I, I think about. And the, the, the first place that I thought about was Miley Cyrus. (laughs) So yeah, with the joyful music, you know, fun is fast in a lot of ways. And some of the teams that were the fastest were playing like, you know, Taylor Swift and Miley Cyrus and Katy Perry. (laughs) But, but, but the reality is if you look at the sporting culture and it's constantly following into the rut of promoting your aggressive persona, like the aggressive competitive combative uh darker sides of yourself that the sporting world promotes you think about the weight room music and the styles of aggressive music that happen in that and human beings human beings like getting fixes some or like getting results but like getting like different like coffee is so popular it does it's it does a predictable and uh, thing I start thinking about like the different cultures that have been a part of that play fun music and have a good time with it. I look at the culture and see what the culture like promotes in terms of the more aggressive stuff that closes blood flow down, but they feel like it's getting their aggro fixed so they can push more weight or get into that style of their persona where they need to vent something that they're processing for themselves personally or athletically anyway. But to be self-aware, I think overall, self-awareness when you're doing stuff, if you're constantly doing the aggro stuff, be aware that you might get the chemical kick from getting aggro, but that's more of a fly and die style. Does that promote it so you walk out of the house or you communicate more compassionately with other people when you're done? Are you walking around full up of the rage that you tried to vent, but you actually ingrained more of it? Another thing is human beings' response to frequency. Sound, frequent, like, like you know, those t- singing bowls and ringing bowls and tuning forks and like the, the cellular response, the life response to uh, frequency. Now, in the chakra chart, you'll have a chakra chart where it has different colors. You'll have you know, these different energy centers that have associated colors that also have associated music notes that also have associated frequency. So Deepak Chopra has a thing called the love tuner, which is a, a, you wear it around your neck, but it's this metal piece that plays a tone. I went over there and it, the, the hertz, like the frequency that it's at correlates with your heart chakra. So if you look at a chakra chart, it'll have like your heart, it'll have a color, a music note and a frequency. And, and, and it's not news to anybody. Life responds differently to different styles of frequencies. And you make your choice on what frequency, what result do you want to get? Do you want to use something that helps with blood flow today or not? Do you want to shorten it up, but get a different fix or what results do you want? And if you're just doing one thing all the time, you're going to atrophy in being a full spectrum, you know, athlete, a versatile person. 
if you're constantly training aggro on a given day, you're not feeling it as much and you feel like, oh, a lack of confidence because you, you're not in your rage zone and you need someone to flap your face harder or something. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it makes me think of the difference between the athlete who just like yanks the handle on the oar and then the athlete who's really efficient on the water. Imagine the, the athlete who's really efficient listening to joyful music and, and having this relaxed rhythm and, and being able to find a smooth efficiency to the stroke and, and having more efficient blood flow. And right. then imagine the athlete who's listening to this aggressive music that's, that's making them tense and the blood flow is not flowing and they're just jerking the oar handle. They might get a lower split in, in that moment because we know the erg kind of rewards that sometimes, but they're probably not going to get faster on the water. Yeah. And I just thought of the super friends of the Justice League with this too, because when you get, you know how it is when you're in a boat of eight different superheroes, like Batman and Superman don't have the same powers and Wonder Woman and the, you know, so you might have, you might have someone that it's better for them to have the aggro music. You might have someone that's better and you get all those people together then it's like the transformers that make the big transformer because they're one guy's the <laughs> arm the other guy's the leg the other guy's the, and you make the ultimate thing so the funny thing about the rowing world is that people are wired so differently that, that sometimes sometimes it's good for somebody to have this or that even though the science might say it's optimal for if we're going for blood flow right now, we're going to have calmer music for you. But the way some people are wired, they'll like, it'll make them mad. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and actually, that's a good clarifying factor, too, is they said, choose music that makes you feel joyful. That. Right. So like the person that listens to aggressive music, maybe it makes them feel joyful that which it does there are communities of people i saw a guy like thrashing on a guitar with his infant son the other day and the infant son was like loving it <laughs> but categorically it's thought of as really aggressive music but some people the way they vibe with it it's just received as like a joyful experience so it's like do you have all eight people listening to their own stuff do you have just everybody's ear pods instead of if you're going if you're going to explore the positive results from music manipulation or sound manipulation do you then prioritize i mean the convenience of the earphone things it's like okay we're going you just say okay have your joy playlist have your aggressive play you know have your and you you actually say okay we're going this style today we're going this style today now we're going, I mean, have you, have you ever had your ear things in while you erg with no music on? Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing too. Like if you just shut it down and then you experience what you're doing in a different color. So I'm pro variety. I'm pro customization. I have a hard time when the culture subsides into a dampened down version of what it could have been just for complacency or convenience or just to make do or you know for me it's a stronger word but perpetuating ignorance is is I, I hate it when an environment holds itself back because they 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 don't think it's realistic to keep going they don't think there's going to be buy-in well i don't i don't see i don't see that there will be buy-in on this or that so there's no there's no further attempt to apply right and a lot of yeah. times it's just it's just finding the right person to communicate in an inspirational way and be like oh no we got to keep trying to get this in we got to keep trying to make this the new normal right and 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 once they see the results you, you get the buy-in like we touched on earlier and and then it just builds on itself from there and you continue to learn you continue to evolve and continuing to improve the sport and ourselves as individuals right You'd hope. You'd hope. That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we touched on a lot, but is there yeah. is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you wanted to to bring up? Human beings respond to sounds, you know. We respond to we have a bunch of different senses. And then as an athlete, we're exploring switching up where we get the sounds from. 
and what the sounds make us feel or how they do it. So it's like, you know, I try to combine my realistic experiences with the in-house with a, a bunch of different teams and you'll run a range of what who embraces it and how enthusiastically and who holds on to it but i think you and i meeting on this sort of thing it's just uh, we're doing our best to keep on encouraging whoever's watching to be like okay be intentional about what you're doing with sounds and where you're getting the sounds from and what the tone of the sounds for and what they inspire because it does have effects it does have an effect on your blood flow your, your your performance your output your splits if you provide a variety of experiences then you'll build up a, a, a more fully developed uh, team and individual and I, I think one of the things people can overlook too is a lot of this research shows that it helps with adherence and enjoyment. And this is like rowing's a long season. And if we're not enjoying the season, it's going to be harder to, to retain a team. Um, yeah. So finding ways to make it joyful. Right. And as responsible adults that, you know, with the world, what are we hoping for? having the privilege of being around younger people or being around athletes that like, like what are we promoting as human beings, you know, in the, in the time that we have in their company, if we can promote, you know, yes, there's hard work. Yes. There's discipline. Yes. There's camaraderie, but to, and it, it's not a floaty thing. It's a very powerful thing the joyful. We have a privilege of being around people and being a part of their lives and, and, and passing on information that we've felt there, uh, is valuable to us. And it's like, yeah, why wouldn't you, with the rowing season, to be able to make it a, 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 a positive part of someone's day? Because you, you don't know what's going on at the house with families. You, you don't know how that person's feeling about themselves mentally. Like the mental health issue in sports is massive on the radar these days, especially with this COVID stuff. So if we can also acknowledge the human experience and really not taking for granted the time that we have together and being a, a, a to um being a proponent or a, 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 a support of joy and compassion and that along with the hard work, then, then, then that's a good place you want to show up. I love that you touched on that because you don't know how many times I've had athletes come to me. I had no idea anything was going on in their life. And they came to me well after they had worked it out uh, with themselves and whoever else. And they just thanked me like, thank you for you know, being positive and supporting me through my struggles. And it's like, I didn't even realize you were struggling. I was just treating you like, like a person, you know, but it, it goes to show the little things in terms of how you treat people are, are really, really important. There's a, um, one of the things I do these summer camps. And one of the things I tell, talk to the coaches when the coaches all have that pre-camp sit down, I, it's a it's a summer camp scenario, and I do this with other teams too. I, I said to them, I was like, we can't assume that everyone is okay. You know, just because it's summer camp and we want to have fun and want to do, we can't assume that everyone's okay. So just be aware that real stuff goes on, and sometimes it's beyond what you could even feel like you could go through yourself you know how humbling that is when you somebody comes up and talks to you about that stuff it's like oh my gosh yeah and and you you feel happy that you were in a good enough space yourself to to be nice to them that day because who knows what could have happened right yeah 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 all right well we we took the, the music article to a, a bunch of different avenues but hopefully it was fun hopefully it was enjoyable um before we finish up here anderson I just wanted you to have the opportunity to, to plug anything that you like, you know, Instagram, website, anything that you're doing. I, I know that you're working with people virtually. Um, I know that you're really experienced and, and have a lot of cool ways to incorporate this with uh, teams and individuals. So let people know. Sure. 
there's a there's a thanks for that that's really thoughtful of you um one of the, the my first instinct the way i am is i i, I want to uh, send out there like if people haven't seen the wim hof documentary uh called the ice man watch that it promotes uh, like it talks of, about uh breathing technique is sometimes referred to as tumo there's alternate nostril breathing there's box breathing there's ujjayi breathing there's a guy named john duyard it's D-U-I-L-L-A-R-D. He did a program called Invincible Athletics, but if you YouTube John Duyard and nostril breathing, there's a, a community of nose breathers that's picking up in the world. So I, there are people that have done really good uh, uh, things on breath work. For me, I've deconstructed what I've learned from yogic breathing. And, and if we're just talking breath work, um, I've deconstructed it into like the different styles of the, the training day, like whether your steady state or whether you're going short or stronger, the start sequence, like uh, when you do moves, like the last five strokes of any piece being spoken for with a disciplined style of breathing rather than just flailing and not having traction on the last five. I've been around the rowing world long enough to deconstruct every every known bit that I can like um, starting at the finish you make a shush sound and then you extend it out to say here's an experiment at a steady state see how how many strokes you can hum for continuously and uninterrupted so sorry I'm long-winded about this so the Wim Hof documentary on about him it just the, any breath work things that you find for yourself try applying them and then on my thing, it's my at, they can contact you and try to get in touch with me if, uh, and I'll send you the and chart. And I'll, I'll, I'll tag you on this stuff as well. Yeah. So my first instinct, when you ask me to promote something, it's like other people can have, have, have said it a lot better than I can say it in a lot more entertaining way. So there's so many resources about these disciplines and then just, uh, those are uh, the Wim Hof thing is a great place to start if you're not familiar and then contact me if you want risk what it is to be joyful occasionally during when you're working hard it may feel like you're risking your normal wheelhouse sort of stuff it going into an unfamiliar thing in a softer what's conceived perceived as a softer emotion but risk a bit of joy in the process and just start to strengthen that muscle. And then soon it won't be a risk. It'll be an attribute and an ally. And you, you built up your, you know, you built up your spectrum. Well, Anderson, thank you so much for your time. And thanks to everyone that listened. We look forward to hearing any feedback from you. Feel free to reach out to any and all of us. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.